Father God, we're so grateful that you have blessed us beyond measure. You've given us reason to be here. And Father, with all of our being, we worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we pray that you will give us a word, a word straight from your throne. Father, we ask that you would be magnified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
a huge, huge thank you to Katrina, Tammy, and Mark for that gorgeous piece. These folks are going to be teaming up for the whole rest of the service, so we are going to be transported, as Job 12 says to us, we will sing to the tambourine and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. Today will be such a day. We're delighted to have Rod and Linda Dendurk back there in the back. Turn around and wave. It is their 60th wedding anniversary. We are so delighted to have them here with us today. They walked over from Krabari, so they've had their morning stretch, and now they're going to have their morning blessing, and then you're going to have your morning cake, because they provided a beautiful anniversary cake for us today, and the flowers are from them. So I think maybe Hal and I will deliver them for you <laughs> after the service, because we really want to celebrate a wonderful, wonderful accomplishment of 60 years. Um, Pastor Bill will be starting a new Thursday Bible study in September. Where do we go from here? So contact the pastor either via email or call the chapel office and um, let him know that you'd like to join him on those Thursday afternoons. They were a really wonderful time of fellowship and learning and study and uh, a chance to reconnect with not only with our Lord but with um, other members here of the chapel. Hal and I are vivid, excuse me, vivid, avid, Olympic watchers. We're vivid, too, sometimes as our faces get flushed from yelling. Um, we keep wondering, how do they do that? What compels them to devote years to torture and practice for a 10-second run? In fact, one of the ads, I don't know if you've seen it, says, for you, it's 10 seconds. For me, it's a lifetime. And it's one of our Olympians. So, the Olympics started about seven, let's see, seven, the seventh century before Christ. So you can imagine how old they were. So the disciples were well aware of the Olympics, and they had them every four years. They were in Olympia. And so if you, if you think about it, I've often wondered if those games were the inspiration for Paul and Barnabas and Luke to compare our Christian walk with a race. Hebrews 12.1 admonishes us, Therefore we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Luke says, However I consider my life worth nothing to me, my only aim is to finish the race and to complete the task the Lord has put in front of me. So I was thinking about this week, and so I did a little research. I don't know if you know my first degree is librarianship. So the old librarian got into the, the uh, research books. Psychology Today did a study of 10 Olympians from um, the 1970s through the 1980s, and they interviewed the Olympians, their coaches, their parents, their friends, to find out what are the characteristics of an Olympian, what makes you a champion. And they came up with 12 things, and I just thought they were magical. Think about your Christian walk and think about these 12. The ability to cope with anxiety and worry. Where do we give our anxiety and worry? To the Lord. Confidence and highly motivated. Mental toughness and resilience. Boy, do we need to be resilient. This guy's had some resilience days in his life. Um, sports intelligence, and if you convert that, it is being an avid student of your discipline. So being an avid student of God's word, being an avid student of the things that he would want us to, want us to do. A go-for-it attitude, never giving up, a strong work ethic, the ability to set and achieve goals, coachability, listening to and learning from others, hopefulness, optimism, and perfectionism in a positive way setting high personal standards. But isn't that the absolute description of our Christian journey? And wasn't Paul, Apostle Paul the perfect coach for Timothy when he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and therefore is laid for me a crown of righteousness. Well, I'll take a crown of righteousness over a gold, silver, or bronze. I just have to wait a little longer. So as you watch the Olympics, do remember how much God has given to all of us and the ability to do all the things that he needs us to do in this life so that he can take us off to a life thereafter. So if you'll kindly stand and join me in singing soon, very soon, 
and then remain standing for silent prayer. Um, you know what, we're going to skip the call to worship because Mark reminded me I forgot. But we have such a wonderful repertoire of things on our program today, we're going to go ahead and just go right to our first hymn. Soon, very soon. silent prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of music. We thank you for the gift of peace as nations come together and join hands and compete in a loving spirit of brotherhood. Father, we thank you for the Dundurks and their wonderful marriage and all the things that you have meant to them. We thank you for Halita and her birthday this week and what a blessing she's been to the chapel. So Father, as we spend this day, may we spend it with you. Amen. You may be seated. My darling husband just pointed at me. You know, I'm just in the throes of forgetfulness. Did you all get the picture? A baby Grace? A baby Gloria? <laughs> baby Grace. Baby Gloria. This is our newest great-granddad. His great-granddaughter was born Tuesday up in Sacramento area, and they named the baby for Gloria, his wife. So thank you, Hal. Congratulations, granddad. Thank you. Thank you. Before we um, have our anthem, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Katrina. She is visiting here from Spain. Um, I have known Katrina for 10 years, and this isn't gonna sound right when I say it, but until this week, I only knew her online. <laughs> now, the way that works is, it turns out that she's a, obviously a terrific flutist, um, but she also has a group in Spain that performed a, a piece of mine, um, quite a lot around Spain, actually. So. Over time, uh, we've, we've been involved in some other musical things together, but also she is not only a terrific flutist, but an award-winning composer as well, uh, and has stuff published 
she actually came all the way to America. This isn't her first time here, but it's her first time to the Bay Area or anywhere in California. And she came for a National Food Association where she did some performing as, as well there. So of course, as with everyone else, you can look her up online. But <laughs> we're just grateful to have her here and I'm thrilled. Um, so and now she's going to perform one of her own pieces. This is called A New Journey. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> because there's no other place I'd rather be in this physical realm than to be here among people who love God and who share their faith with other people. I pray this morning that you experience God's presence. That's the whole purpose of us gathering together, to experience God's presence, that he might speak to us in the hour of our need, and that we will leave this place refreshed and renewed in spirit and in mind. Let us pray. Father God, we are so grateful that you are present. We are confident that when we gather together in your name, you are present. 
For in your presence there is fullness of joy. And that joy becomes our strength from day to day. We pray for those who might have infirmities in their body. You are our healer. And we pray that you will disperse healing for them and give them the use of the faculty of their being. Father, we are so grateful that you put us in family even when our physical family is no longer on the scene. Thank you for your mercy that endures forever. And Father, we pray that you would bless Emil and Judy and thank you for their love for you and this community. And Lord, as you've taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Get ready. God has good stuff for you. Would you stand and join me in the doxology, please? the privilege of giving. We thank you for the privilege of participating with other Christians to share your word around the world, around our nation, and around our own neighborhoods. Father, bless the giver and bless those who can't because they'll receive a different blessing but a magnificent blessing from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Yeah, I brought the big one here. Life sometimes doesn't come out like the way you anticipate it. Neither does your printing come out the way you participate. <laughs> so I, I just brought my laptop, and if the laptop doesn't work, I brought my Bible. So we're going to get through this. I am so glad that uh, you are waiting patiently and doing all you can to prepare yourself for the Lord's coming. I want to do something a little different this morning. Is that okay? I guess you don't have any other choice, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to do something different. Uh, I want you to take a look at your application. I'm going to start from the application we've been talking about where love is for the past month or so, and hopefully today I will be able to complete these remaining verses of Scripture. Um, so many people are looking for love and not being successful in finding it. You have come to a place this morning where you can experience love. Hello, somebody. Where God is, there is love. And we've gathered here today in this place to worship God in spirit and in truth. Your application Understanding where love comes from enables you to overcome what? Anything and everything. When you understand where love comes from, when you fully commit to loving others, guess what happens? Look at your application. What happens? You will never run out of grace to forgive. Never run out of grace to forgive because love is in you and we understand that love covers a few faults. <laughs> love covers a multitude of faults and sins. God has covered you and I with his love. And his love has come into the person representing his son, Jesus Christ. He has loved us with an everlasting love. And we just want to talk a little bit about his love that he has so graciously given to all of us and I want to read these scriptures to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I left off on verse 7. I finished verse 7. With your prayers this morning, we're going to get through this passage of scripture and conclude at verse 13. Amen? Amen. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man... And you can say, when I became a woman, I put away childish things. For when I put away childish things, I was beginning to be that mature person. Verse 12, 
Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know even as I have fully, have been fully known by God. So faith, hope, love abide. These things, these three things, but the greatest of these is love. Love never ends. Hallelujah, somebody. So that says to me, when I fell in love, Anybody fell in love? Are you still falling? <laughs> if love never ends, that means that I can never fall out of love. Uh-oh. Excuse me. Some of you don't see that. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. The Corinthians were impressed by the gifts of the Holy Spirit and being amazed at what God was doing through the lives of people. And these gifts were bestowed upon the believers for us to do the work of Jesus Christ and these gifts from the Spirit of God are for imperfect people living in an imperfect time. Let us remember the fact that the gifts are temporary in concern to eternal life. And we must use these gifts that God has given us with the utmost humility and respect. While we wait for the Lord's return, God is using every person who has come into relationship with Jesus Christ and gifted them to advance and edify the kingdom of God. So as believers, we have received gifts from God's Spirit to encourage, to edify, to build up the body of Christ, to advance God's kingdom on this earth. Well, some of you are looking like you're giftless. <laughs> well, what, what, where's my gift? I don't feel that I'm so gifted. God has given each and every person in the body of Christ, a gift. It could be hospitality. It could be kindness. It could be the ability to be an influence with what God has given you to, dream, to, to draw people to Christ. While we wait for the Lord's return, God is using every person in the church. Every person has limits and times associated with the effectiveness of their gifts as a witness for Jesus Christ. Each gift we receive operates through the weakness of human flesh. God chooses to use weak things to confound the mighty. And I'm one of those weak things. And I'm just waiting for the next surgery. Whatever. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. This body of clay belongs to him. So he is the ruler of my life. And he is the one who is sustaining me and also sustaining you. You are being sustained by the Lord. Not because you're so healthy. Not because you eat healthy foods. Not because you exercise daily, you and I are being sustained by God's love. And we know that we have received these gifts that God has given us for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people can come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ through our 
lives, through our testimony, Paul is saying that the time will come when these gifts that God has given us will no longer be necessary. Even preaching will no longer be necessary because when that which is perfect has come, then that which is of a lesser value has been done away with. Speaking in other languages to, com to communicate the gospel of grace will end because we will ultimately be where? With the Lord. We will ultimately be with the Lord. That is what we live to die for. I had a friend that, that was his expression always. When he had something very good or experienced something very good or ate something that was very good, he says, oh, this is so good to die for. Well, we live to die to live again. And we know and are assured of where we will spend eternity because we have received God's love gift. What is God's love gift? Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And every day I'm reminded of the frailty of this vessel of clay that I'm in. It doesn't work like it used to work at 25. Hello. Or 35. Or, 35, or 45. Or 55. Or 65. Not even 75. So we're being reminded that, hey, things are slowing down. We don't have the same capacity that we had. We don't have the same abilities that we used to have. We are coming to a close. But love never ends. Love never fails. Verse 9, for we know in part... And we prophesy in part. We know in part. Our knowledge is limited. And you know what I'm learning? The older I get, the more my knowledge is limited. <laughs> because I can't remember. As I'm praying for you. <laughs> but we know that God has promised us eternal life. And regardless of what happens in our lives and what happens in the world, we know that we have a destination. And we live with eternity in view every single day of our lives. We are imperfect people contending for the knowledge of the Holy One as we walk and live by faith in this life. To prophesy is to share a message from God of an event that will happen. To proclaim, to foretell. To prophesy is the ability through the Spirit of God to share a mystery that was unknown. Equally, knowledge is given to speak, teach, or preach through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is just a thin slice of the mystery of God, of who God is. We cannot contain the knowledge of God in this body of clay, we are not capable of retaining everything there is about God. So we learn 
as we live about God. Similarly, any revelation from God to the church through someone with the gift of prophecy only reveals a little bit, not the full picture. God may say something to you, but you don't have the whole picture. So we walk by faith. We believe God. And everyone who is encouraged by the word of God lives with hope. It is a, an enormous picture of the full revelation of who God is. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for who? Who is us? Those that love him. He's got good stuff, great stuff, beyond our imagination, beyond our ability to think for us. And we are so consumed and so worried about the tangible, what we can see, as opposed to what God has promised us. So that the things that we see, we know that they are going to vanish. Did you wake up this morning and discover a new wrinkle? Or a lack of a hair. So everything that is temporal is going away. And we're just trying to hang on. First John chapter 3 verse 2 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been fully revealed. But we know when Christ appears, guess what's going to happen? Guess what's going to happen? We are going to be like his glorified body. Oh, praise God. We're going to be like him. New skin. No wrinkles. No broken down bodies. We're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. Verse 10, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. That which is imperfect will pass away. The time will come when the most significant gift completes all other gifts to the glory of God. What is the greatest gift we've received? The gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That gift will not be actualized until we come into the presence of God. So what do we do while we're here? We rejoice because we know that we're going to live again. We rejoice because we know that this is temporary. Our situation is temporary. Our pain is temporary. Our discomfort is temporary. Our loneliness is temporary. Our suffering is temporary. Everything that we go through in this life is temporary. There are two views about the, the completion of, of that which is perfect and that which is partial. The perfect comes to completion when the Bible in the book of Revelations is finished. When everything that has been prophesied in the book of Revelations is completed. And the other thought is that when we as believers are in God's eternal presence. We've completed our work. We've completed our mission. And some people have these two views. 
Well, at the end of Revelations, everything will be perfect. Well, when we get to heaven, everything will be perfect. So whichever view you choose, when we get to heaven, will be completed. So the word of God has to be proclaimed and preached until that end day, that time on earth will be no more as we know it. Until then, the church is continually being edified by the Spirit of God, and preachers are preaching, and teachers are teaching, and exercising the gifts that God has given us. We don't say, well, uh, this is mine. I, I, I can't give this. This is mine. This is all mine. No, it's for the benefit of everyone. So that everyone is built up and encouraged and strengthened. We know in part and we prophesy in part, just as we said in verse 9, when we reach heaven, the partial things will give away to the perfect and preaching and teaching will no longer be needed. And some of you are saying, I'm glad. <laughs> verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man or woman, I gave up childish ways. When we was a child, we lived by our feelings and impressions and fears as a child. Oh, Mom, I see something in my room. The boogeyman. Oh, he's under the bed. We felt something. We saw something. And we were children. You, why did you choose to say something bad about a person you didn't have a valid reason? As a child, you decided not to like someone because your friend didn't like the person. As a child, you were willing to compromise the truth for fear of rejection from your peers. So you went along with it as a child. When you couldn't have your way, you pouted. And you criticized others as a child. Becoming a man or woman of God is about living out the truth and pleasing the Lord. You decided and your desire was to live as a witness for God's grace as you extended forgiveness and acceptance to broken people. This message right here is for grown folks, mature people, People that have experienced God's grace that has come into their lives. You see, all of us know what it is to be human. We can identify with the human experience, but when it comes to identifying Christ, we have difficulty identifying Christ to other people. Well, I don't want to offend anybody uh, if I tell that lady that she's loved uh is she gonna how is she gonna react is she think that i'm trying to uh impress her or say something or man god has something good for you and he's all tattooed up and you're afraid to walk up to him and say man god loves you and he's got some good things in store for your life you see, if you are a person of love, what does love do? Love overcomes. Love overcomes everything. Love overcomes evil. Love overcomes. 
So I'm sitting and I'm so thrilled and excited that I'm sitting in the midst of overcomers. Hallelujah, somebody. As God has loved you, as you are loving other people, you are overcoming evil. Because the devil is evil and he has unleashed demons. And people are acting out. Verse 12 in closing, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall be known fully, even as I have been fully known. In Paul's day, Corinth was famous for producing polished bronze mirrors or other materials, unlike our mirrors today. You go to a mirror today, you can clearly see. Where did that come from? That wasn't there last night. Oh, that's so ugly. Oh, I don't think I'm going to church today. <laughs> Any old excuse to do. Paul used the analogy of looking in a mirror, using the gifts of the Spirit was like getting to know Christ by looking at him through a mirror. When he returns, we will see him in person. You know, it's good to have a picture of someone. And some of the pictures went out concerning my wife and our great-granddaughter, and they were fuzzy. They weren't clear. So I'm looking at this picture, and it's all fuzzy. But see, when I come to her and I see her face to face, it's all clear. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we hope for and we long to see the Lord face to face. I could tell you I love you all day long. But there's nothing like looking at you in the eyes and seeing your expression and your response when I say I love you. Thank you. And we love God and we want him to know that he is loved by us and that we love him and that we're going to do his will and follow his, his lead. Using the gifts of the Spirit was like getting to know Christ by looking at him through a mirror. When he returns, we will see him in person. Then the mirror, the spiritual gifts, representing the mirror, will no longer be needed. So the gifts that God has given you on this earth to glorify him with will no longer be needed. Because we will come to a completion. Verse 13, so now faith, hope, love abides. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Love. God covers you every day with his love. I know those are crickets. Every day he covers you with his love. You don't wake up without having been loved in the night season. You may have had a restless night of sleep, but you arrive in the morning being loved through the night season. And you ought to know that God will never, ever stop loving you. Love is the greatest because God is love. So if I'm loving God, he gives me the capacity to love others in unlovable situations. Oh, this is deep, isn't it? He has graced you with the greatest weapon, the greatest defense, 
I had a neighbor when I lived uh, in Fremont. She was cantankerous and, you know, looking for reasons to hate people. And uh, my kids got into something, neighbors or whatever, and uh, she came out of the house. Oh, she was a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> and my word to her was, you know where I'm going with this? God bless you. <laughs> and God bless you too. <laughs> That's how we deal with conflict. We bless those who curse us and, dis and despise us. We bless them because greater is he that is within us. God sealed you with a perfect gift when you came and ask him to come into your heart. He sealed you with his spirit in order for you to deal with life's issues and controversy so that you wouldn't look at life, oh me, oh my, but that you would look at life knowing that the person who is in you is greater than your situation. Hallelujah, somebody. We believe in dropping H-bombs here. Hallelujah is our H-bomb. When we have sinned and became estranged from God, he sacrificed his only son to restore our relationship. The greatest gift that God has given us is love. And the greatest thing that we can do for each other is love each other with the love that we've received from him. Hello, somebody. So some people who have not a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've got to love the hell out of them. Amen. Amen. Because the devil is busy taking people by the thousands, leading them to hell. And so the, your greatest weapon is love. Jesus said to us, love your enemies. How are you going to do that without a relationship with Jesus Christ? An intimate relationship with him. Father God, I am so grateful that you love us with a love that is difficult for us to comprehend at times. We thank you for your mercy that endures forever. And Father, we want you to use every fiber of our being to magnify your name. Thank you, Lord, for health and strength that you've given us for this day's journey. And Father, we pray for those who are standing or sitting in a valley of decision who have not decided where they're going to spend eternity. Lord, we thank you that you have given them an invitation today to know for sure where they can be in the end of this age. Father, we bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have our benediction. Thank you for being here and uh, bearing under the weight of the message. God bless you. Yes. 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 Well, it, well, let's do this. We don't have to do the benediction. We can do the postlude. Okay? So, uh, 
our dear sister is going to play for us and continue to worship God. And I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may God use you for the furtherance of his kingdom. Uh, remain in your positions. Thank you. 
Bravo, bravo, bravo. Bravo. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Katrina.